Let's start our services. Got some announcements here today. Uh, Kathy Simmons is uh, seems to be doing better, uh, but she is having some trouble with her right side. Uh, Jeff Dunn has uh, been seizure free now for many days, and he will start the type of chemo Sunday, and he'll be on it for the rest of his life. Thank you, thank you for your prayer for this case. And Rhonda's sister-in-law is doing better. We'll remember to keep hopefully in our prayers. It looks like she will have to have some surgery in the future. And Delta White's son is having trouble with his eye after an injury from the Gulf War. And Patty Vaughn, uh, she'll see a kidney doctor on Tuesday. And she's trying to get cleared so she can have a heart attack. Uh, and Dr. Had a surgery on Friday and is at Ruby Hospital in Morgantown. Uh, somebody said that she doesn't look good. And poor little boy in Belfry got shot, three years old, and he has cancer. And Ruth Lemon has been having some more uh, problems with trembling. Want to remember to keep her in her prayers. And Lonnie Jones has been in and out of the hospital and back in and in with the uh, infection. And Janice Martin uh, had a sore on her leg and they took it off, had a biopsy and it showed the cancer. And she will have it removed on Monday. And is there any other announcements from the state? Hey, I just got word yesterday that they're taking Kathy Simmons to help South supposedly for that, but she can have more physical therapy there. Okay. Dr. Simmons will be going to help us out. Okay, remember all these people and keep them in your prayers and uh, just hope they get well soon. And for the upcoming events, tomorrow is President's Day and it's the Monday night merge at Lower Paul Paul at 7 o'clock. And on the 24th, uh, CYC at Pigeon Ford. And that's it for all the news for right now. Is there any other events? And I uh, want to welcome the visitors today. And uh, let me please, you're welcome, and please come back whenever you have the opportunity to do so. And, uh, Larry, if you want to leave the same, we'll turn it over to him. Number 30 will be our first song this morning. Number 32. Thank you. Thank you. I've made so many mistakes today, but I did get up and I'm here. That's a miracle. Be Thank you. 
Matthew chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjan, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That's Byron's prayer. Father in heaven, holy is your name. Father, thank you for this wonderful day on earth that you've given us and the freedom and the health that we have as we gather here. Please be with us all so everything here might be pleasing in your eye. Please forgive us for when we fall short and be with us we need you better in the future. And please be with those who mentioned the prayer list so they can feel all their illness and grief. Your son is right to stay with friend. Amen. Number three, seven. <laughs> Jesus, uh, how he was uh, crucified, um, and on the night that Jesus was uh, uh, betrayed, he set forth this memorial so uh, 
stepple bread and the fruit of the vine, which we were to take the uh, first day of the week to remind us of the sacrifice that was made. And this the short scriptures I read there, you know, it doesn't go into the detail, but uh, if you know the history and read some of the other uh, things in the Bible, Jesus was, uh, he was beaten, spit upon, uh, it was a very cruel and humiliating death. So uh, as we uh, partake of this bread at this time, let's just uh, keep in mind the sacrifice that was made for the whole world and the reason the way we uh, partake of this. So let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer at this time. Let's uh, thank you, Father, for Jesus' willingness to uh, be use his body as a sacrifice for us, Father. And we pray, Father, as we take this bread, that it would be done in a way that be pleasing unto you. And we just pray that you be with us here as we partake of this and uh, the members of your church throughout the world as they partake of this today. We pray this to your son Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's uh, continue in prayer. Dear Father, we come again to you in prayer. Thank you for this fruit of vine which you've given us to uh, represent Jesus' blood, Father. And we just pray, thank you more so for the, the blood that was shed, Father. And again, we pray that you be with each and every one here and we partake of it. And we uh, pray that it would be done in a way that would be pleasing unto you. We pray this through your Son, Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. And uh, being the first day of the week, we are also commanded to uh, give a portion of which we've been blessed with financially to help the work of the church. And there's uh, baskets on the table back there for your contribution. And that is for the members of the church who I are referring to. <clears throat> Number 482. 482. <laughs> oh, land of rest for the eyesight when will the moment come? When I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace and home? Thank you. 
16. First two lines of this song. We saw the Lord when the hours come to this poor world of sin and death. No more can be held by college of in that despise and Nazareth. But we believe that the world has trod its streets and plains. question that he asked, who do men say that I am? And we remember we were coming off several things that had happened with, with Jesus that he had dealt with in chapter 15. He started talking about the traditions of them washing their hands before they ate and, and how they defiled the person. And, and remember we talked about the, the faith of the Canaanite woman, I think that was three Sunday nights ago. And and how her faith was mighty. And then we go into the story that we remember Jesus feeds 4,000 in chapter 15. And then we come to this, uh, uh, they ask for a sign in the beginning of chapter 16. And then, then Jesus finds himself in, into foreign territory, if you will, the region of Caesarea Philippi, which we discussed that was a, a area that um, had very few Jews. And the Jews that were there were very hostile against Jesus. It was mainly a Gentile nation. And, and so those Gentiles were, of course, hostile to Jesus. And so he finds himself in what we call a hostile territory. And he begins asking, who do people think that I am? And he gets a, a group of different names that people are saying in, in chapter 16, verse 14, 15. Some say John the Baptist, and, and some others say Elijah, and, and some say Jeremiah. You're just like the, the weeping prophet Jeremiah. And, and he looks at Peter, and as we'll discover today, Peter seems to always be the guy in the front of all the apostles. But he looks at Peter and the other apostles and says, who do you say that I am? And he answers, says, well, you're Christ, you're the son of the living God. And so when we come to our text that we're looking at this morning, we know that God is the great revealer. And we see that as the passage that was read just a second ago. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So, so Christ and, and God are, are the great revealers. They, they, they show us the church, if you will. You know, if there's ever been questions about the church, it's in our day and age, isn't it? 
where there's, you can open the phone book and find literally hundreds or maybe even thousands of what we would call churches or religions or places of worship that you can go. And they seem to be on every corner and every block. And so Jesus has this conversation in chapter 16 of Matthew that is setting the, the platform, if you will, for the church. As we know, when we get to the church in, in verse 18, the church is based on this testimony of Jesus Christ. And God is the great revealer of the church. So if we go back and say, well, where do we go with God? We go all the way back to creation in Genesis chapter 1, and we know it was God. And, and we see through the Bible, God, God, God. And so when it's time to look for the church, we would kind of look to where God is steering us towards the church. And Jesus pronounced that Peter blessed both because of his knowledge of this truth and because of the source from which the knowledge came from God. And blessed, the scribes, is another word for happy or happiness. Now, we know in, in Matthew chapter 16, or Matthew chapter 5, excuse me, um, when Jesus begins his Sermon on the Mount, he starts about this blessed. You see this word blessed. And, and, and we know about receiving a blessing, don't we? We kind of pray for that. Well, I hope that, that, that so-and-so receives a blessing. What does that mean? That, that means they get something in their life that makes them happy. That's a blessing. Good news, maybe. That's a blessing. Someone helping them. That, that's a blessing. You know, something that they didn't plan on receiving, but they were, that's a blessing. And so, you know, we look at Israel and God just poured the blessings on Israel as long as they were obedient to him. And so when we think about the blessings, we think about Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 and following. He said, and, and these are things that we would normally not think are blessings. What we blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, that's usually something that we don't think is a blessing. And then Jesus says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed or happy are those who mourn. Well, those are two words that, that contradict each other. Someone who's mourning is usually not happy. But Jesus says, that's okay. That's okay. Blessed are those who are happy are those who mourn. Why? Because there should be comfort. They'll be comforted. And then he goes on, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom where they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful. They'll receive mercy. Blessed are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they should be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when, when others rile and vow against you and persecute you for all kinds of evil. And so if we know about a, a blessing or a happiness, you know, Jesus certainly gives us insight into that. And when he looks at Matthew, or, or excuse me, uh, Peter here, you know, Peter is blessed for just the knowledge of that and knowing it was God and, and, and because of this truth had been revealed to him, not by men, not by flesh and blood, but by the Father in heaven. And the fact that the truth was revealed by the Father may refer to teachings and miracles done certainly by Christ. Matthew 11, verse 25 and 26, at that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to your little children. Yes, Father, for such you were gracious, the gracious will. So Jesus made it clear that his message and his mission came from God. In John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus said to this, My food is to do the will of the Father who sent me. In other words, my task or my job is to do what, what God sent me to this earth to do. My food is to do his will. And Peter observed observation of Jesus' ministry uh, may have led him to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Here's the statement. Well, who do you say that I am? He said, I, I believe that you're Christ, the Son of the living God. 
What made him to believe that? Well, well, maybe it's verses like Matthew chapter 14. We see Jesus walking on the water. And in verse 33, and those who were in the boat worshipped him and said, truly, this is the Son of God. Or Peter would say in 2 Peter 1, verse 20, 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God. And so Peter knew what he learned from God, and they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 10, Paul would say this, beginning in verse 13, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And so we're, we're dealing with a, a time where many did not believe it was Jesus. Now some said, is that John the Baptist over there? Is that, is that, is his name Elijah? Maybe that's Jeremiah, the, the weeping prophet. But maybe it's, you know, and this is the very non-specific. it's just another prophet. Can, can you imagine being Jesus and, and you're trying to establish the fact that you are the Son of God, that you were born of a virgin, that you came to save the, the world from their sins, and that you were going to shortly die on the cross, and you're trying to convince people of this truth. And when you stand before them, they look at you and say, I'm not really sure who that guy is. He could be this guy, he could be that guy, he could be the other guy. And the one guy that's kind of the head of the apostles, if you will, Peter, he says, I know who you are. You're Jesus. And I'm sure the other apostles kind of went along, yeah, 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 that's Jesus. Well, well, how do you know that? It's not because some guy over there told me it's, it's been revealed by God. Well, 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 maybe it's the miracles. Maybe it's something else that was done, but God has revealed it. Well, in our day and time, how do you know that? God's not going to come down and produce a miracle and say, do you believe in Jesus? And so Paul gives that answer in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. He says, well, well you got to hear it from somebody. Now, he uses the word preacher here in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall he preach unless he be sent? Well, that word preacher that he uses is really someone who would cry out. I was thinking about newspapers. Newspapers have changed over the years. When I was a young kid, I used to get up in the morning and deliver newspapers and all that. And, and maybe you remember that time of, of maybe some of y'all delivered newspapers or, or, or things like that. And, 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 but now you open your phone and there's a news flash. Or you go to a computer and, and, and Yahoo or Fox News or, or whoever you might watch kind of pops onto your computer and you just click on it and, and you can read the story. You can know about it just about instantly. You don't have to wait for the paper to be printed and, and, and the newsboy to get up and deliver it to your door. We don't do that anymore. Or rarely, things have changed. And, but this word comes from that old word, if you will, for crier. It's back when they had the, the person on the corner would say, Read all about it, read all about it, you know, this happened or that happened, you know, and he would cry the news out. And the idea of, of crying that one story out would get you to, it was supposed to get you locked in. Oh, I'm going to go and spend whatever the price was, 10 cents, 15 cents, whatever, on that paper. Because they would, it was a news crier. And so that's what that, that word preacher here means in Romans chapter 10. And in verse 13 and following, it means a crier. Now, it doesn't have to have be somebody who's gone to preaching school or, or, or anything like that. It could be anybody that knows about the Word of God. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, just think about all the other things that we share. Some, some things were doctrines about. Our, well, did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? And, and we know so much information we think that we think about, we might have a doctrine in that. And so we share a lot of information in this world. Why not share about Jesus? And so Jesus is the great revealer, and he begins to reveal his church. And we see in the next verse that he reveals the church, and we, Christ will say, I will build my church. 
We see that in verse 18, and I tell you that you are Peter, Petra, and upon this rock, very, there's one letter difference, by the way, in the original language of Greek between Peter and rock. Another one letter means a little bit different. Peter's name that he was given, first he was given Cephas. Cephas is, is the name that Christ had given him originally. And then when you translate that into the Greek, it's Peter. And, and Cephas is the feminine. And, and Peter is the, the masculine part of that word. And if you, if you look at parts of speech. And, and, and so Peter would be the masculine. He brings them into the masculine. You are Peter. And upon this rock, now that we're uh, Petra and Petra is the difference there. And that means a, a bed of rocks. And so you are Peter, upon this rock I will build. But I want you to notice, what's it say? It's a possessive pronoun. For those of you who aren't English majors, I'm not an English major, but I know that. My church is Christ saying a possessive pronoun. It belongs to who? Christ. If I say that this is my pad, that means it belongs to me. Mike, I don't know. But, uh, you know, if, if this is my songbook, that means that's my songbook, and you guess what? You might be able to look at it, but you can't, can't have it because it's mine. It's my property. And, and so Christ says, this is my church. So that's a pronoun here. And then he has the gates of hell or Hades, depending on your version, shall not prevail against it. And, and so we see this, this name here, and, and, and so there's no question with the apostles that are gathered around them whose church it is. Now, this is really the first time we talked about talk about the church. The word church here is called ecclesia, is the Greek word for that. It is used only in math, only by the writer Matthew in the Gospels. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and Matthew chapter 18, uh, one of the verses there. It is not used by Luke, it is not used by Mark, it is not used by John. But it is used 118 times in other places in the New Testament by other New Testament writers to mean church. And so this is Christ's church. When we begin to look at some of this, we see in Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, the names of the 12. Now, Peter, like I said, is kind of leading the group here, isn't he? Now, when we see different passages that we look at, we see Peter in that leadership position. When we see them in Matthew chapter 10, when we're kind of being introduced, and we talked a little bit about this chapter in Bible class this morning, we're kind of being introduced to the apostles, and we see this. The names of the 12 were these. First, Simon, who is called Peter. Now, all through the New Testament, he seems to be pushed up by Christ to the forefront. Whether he wants that job or not, it's kind of like Moses. Moses did not want the job he got. God says, Moses, you're going to lead Israel. And Moses is like, oh, yeah, no thank you, I don't want to do that. Moses, you're going to lead Israel. I, God, I'm not a good speaker. and You got the, the wrong guy for that. Moses, you're going to lead. And he's like, please, God, anybody. He's like, okay, Moses, you're going to lead Israel. I'll give you air to speak. Okay. And it's kind of funny because Aaron starts and Moses goes, get out of the way. Pretty much how it went. And Moses led Israel. So Peter is in the forefront here. First, these first Simon, Peter is, or Simon is called Peter, Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. By the way, Matthew wrote the book of Matthew. Tax collectors aren't even popular in our day, are they? You hear the IRS is coming to your house, you're like, oh. You know, they're not even, and so they were less popular in these days because they were scandalous. They, most tax collectors stole. They were professional thieves in this day. They, they would take what they owed and guess what? A little bit more. And so you have, you know, so it's interesting, the people that Jesus chose to lead his church from all realms of society, from fishermen to tax people to, to everybody else here that he chooses. So he has Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Zebedee, uh, Thaddeus, Simon, the Zealot, Zel and of course we know the last one, Judas Iscariot, who turns out to be what? A thief. And 
then someone who hands Jesus off to the enemy. So he has an interesting group of people that surround him. Now, after Jesus' ascension, he Peter kind of led the role. Because if you remember, after Jesus ascends into heaven in Acts chapter 1, why stand ye gazing into heaven? The same Jesus who you've seen taken away will come again in like manner. And, and, and they're just kind of gazing and saying, hey, what do we do now? So they're kind of, kind of thrown off their game, so to speak. And, and Peter, once again, he's kind of the head of the group and he, he brings them together. And, and so, you know, what do we have to, well, first of all, we have to replace Judas. So Peter is, is the head of that in Acts chapter 1, in verse 15 through 22. Well, what's he do next? Well, we have that big sermon in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And who do they put up there preaching to, to all the people but Peter? And that's, you know, pretty much the famous sermon where we see verses like Acts chapter 2, 38, and other verses. Well, then we have the, the, the transference of the miracle, the miraculous gifts, uh, to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. And Peter is there for that. The spreading of the gospel to the Gentiles. Remember that. We'll look at that in just a second when we talk about the keys of the kingdom. Acts, just, excuse me, Acts chapter 10. And so Peter is, is, is a vital, very, very vital. It can't happen without Peter. It can't. Unless God had put somebody else in there. He didn't. And so he's a vital part of that. And finally, the settling of the Jewish Gentile debate. Remember the, what they call the Jerusalem Council in, in Acts chapter 15. That's, that's why part of the book of Galatians is written. is because of this. Because the, the Jews would say, well, you know, we had to be circumcised when we became, you know, part of the tribe, you know, Christians and things like that. Certainly the Gentiles have to do the same thing. And so they would argue back and forth. And they said, oh, it's called a, a, a big debate, a big convention. And they all went to Jerusalem for this big convention. And they came out saying that the Gentiles did not have to do what the Jews had to do. They did not have to be circumcised. And of course, the Jews didn't really like that as much. But Peter, actually, and James were vital parts of that. And when we look at the church in the Bible, we see... A few passages. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. He put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. Paul would say. Ephesians 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the what? Wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And, and we, we see the local congregation in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 2, that the church of God that is at Corinth. And he goes on. And then we look at some more verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18. For the first place, when you come together as a church, ecclesia, the called out. So we see that, that Jesus is saying with this personal pronoun, this is my church. And then all the scriptures, and there's more that we read through the Bible that we see, it's the, the called out, called out by who? Called out by God, the great revealer, to, into his church. And so when I want to become religious in my life, I'm going to look for the church that Jesus ordained, that he built, that he's part of. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul would say, be careful, pay careful attention to yourselves, talking to the elders of Ephesus, and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, 19, knowing that you were ransomed, ransomed into the church. And Jesus said that the gates of Hades or the power of death. When you see that phrase, the gates of Hades shall not overcome it, or the gates of hell, whichever term you want to use, which means that, that Jesus was going basically to the, the Hadean realm. And when we look at that in other passages, we see that there's paradise and that there's the Hades part of the Hadean realm. So he's going to that realm of the Hadean, and that's where we go. When we die, we wait for judgment day, and then from that we go to heaven or hell. And, and, and so when we talk about Jesus going there, he says, basically saying that death will not keep me from starting the church. And that's important. 
because that was Satan's plan. If I could only make Jesus sin, then the church isn't going to start. If I could only kill Jesus, then the church isn't going to start. But Satan didn't really know that the church would not start until they did kill Jesus as a sacrifice. Well, finally, this morning, I want you to notice that Peter is given the keys to the kingdom. Now, if I put a, a, a cup or a bowl or something or clay or whatever I, I could around this room and, and, and say, everybody put your keys in it, most people would have keys this morning, I imagine. I, I, I've got a set of keys here, and, and I, I, my, my keychain is my big old fob for my car, and, and, and then I got a house key, and I got a, a building key for the church here, and then I got a key for my shed, in case anybody wants anything that's in my shed, and plenty of stuff there, y'all help yourself, and uh, clean it up while you're in there. And then, uh, I'm not really, oh, that's the office. The office has a separate key downstairs, so I have a key for that. And, and, and so, not very many keys on there, but you know, they all have their purpose, don't they? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, be bound in heaven. We're not going to have a lot of time to digest that second part this morning, but we'll, we'll just briefly look at it. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. So that's a, a thing we can dive into, but I want to dive into this keys for just a, a, a minute. After promising that Jesus has to build his church, he promised Peter, and, and it's kind of like, okay, for you, here they are. Here's the keys. Now, if I give so if I, if I give Tyler the keys, I'd expect he'd go out and he'd start my car. And he might take it for a little ride. I don't know, he might take it for lunch. Who knows what he'd do with it. And I might, if I can track that car, Tyler, on my phone, so don't go far. But uh, it's new technology we have today, we can track everything. But, you know, I would expect him to use the keys, wouldn't I? Or else I would never give him the keys. If I gave him the keys, and he's, I can see him drooling at the mouth right now, he's wanting them. I would never not expect him to use the keys. Now, I sh if, if I should make some rules when I give the keys, shouldn't I? Okay, Tyler, you can have the keys for 24 hours. But after 24 hours, you bring the car back. Okay? Well, then he should understand that, that after a certain amount of time, he should bring it back. But Peter is given the keys to the kingdom. Now, the words kingdom confuses people sometimes. But kingdom and church are used interchangeably all throughout the New Testament. Some will say that the kingdom is not going to come until Christ comes. Because you see in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And earth is in heaven. He'll give us this day our daily bread. Okay, we can't necessarily pray that prayer the same because the kingdom is the church and it's already come. So those two words are used interchangeably in the New Testament. And, and so here Peter is saying, and at this, this time when he's handed the keys, it had not the church had not started yet. So Peter's task as the what we would call head apostle is to start the church. Jesus said, This is my church. Peter, here are the keys. You start it. And you can't start it till I die. And I'm alive again. So Jesus dies. Three days later, he raises from the dead. We know that many, many saw him. Paul would say many times, 500 saw him. Now after they see Jesus, he's on the earth for 40 days. Acts chapter 1, as they stand there staring, he rises up into heaven. Ten days go by. A Jewish festival is happening, so everybody comes into Jerusalem for the Jewish festival, Passover. For the day of Pentecost, excuse me. And so they're there for a day of Pentecost, and Peter preaches that first sermon in Acts chapter 2. He uses the keys the first time there. Now, we know that the gospel is for all, but at this point in time, it's only for the Jewish people that came for that celebration. And so that's their specific audience that they're 
preaching to. We see in a couple of verses, Matthew chapter 16, verse 28, true, Jesus truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in the kingdom. In other words, the church. That's how we know that the church is the kingdom. One of the reasons is because there are people there in that day, if we're waiting until judgment day, well, they are, they're all dead now, aren't they? He says, some of you won't taste death until you see the church come, until you see the kingdom come. Colossians 1, verse 13, he was delivered us from the dominion of darkness, has transferred us into the kingdom of light. Well, then we see in Acts chapter 10, some years have gone by. There's estimates of maybe up to 14 years have gone by now. And Cornelius comes on the scene. Peter uses the keys to the kingdom for the Gentiles. Now you not only have Jews, but you have Jews and Gentiles. In the church. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. And the living one I died. And behold I am alive furthermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. See Peter has the keys to the kingdom. To start the church for the Jews and for the Gentiles. And, and it's Christ's church. The keys are given to, to Peter by Christ. It's his church. And we see in Revelation 1.18 that Jesus is the only person that has the keys over death and Hades. Jesus says, I will build my church. I was the youth minister for the Pine Castle Church of Christ for three years and actually until I moved to this area. The only reason I left there is because I got married and I moved to this area and and, and Pine Castle, so, and some of you know that uh, some people that go there down in Orlando, wonderful church, and, and I was there with another minister by the name of Bill, and Bill one day says, well, Elvis, we're going to get some shirts. I said, well, that's great. What kind of shirts are we going to get? He says, you and I are going to get polo shirts, and we're going to get Pine Castle Church of Christ written on the shirt in embroidered. I said, well, that's great. Well, the church shirt I had was a, a church from a, a shirt from a youth rally that was said spam on it. Spiritually pumped and motivated. That picture of the can of spam. You know. And uh, I got a lot of questions on that shirt. Spam or not that shirt, yeah. But I was excited to get that shirt. And, and first of all, I always wear polo. I never really wear t-shirts very often at all. I'm always like a polo type of guy. That's just me. Um, or, or dress shirts. And so I was like, oh, Oh, this is great. I, I, I still have that shirt today in my closet, and I, I don't wear it because it's too big for me now. I was a little bit bigger back then, but I was so proud of that shirt because of what it said on it, not because it was the color it was or because of anything else, but because it said Church of Christ on it. And I left the pal. And I wore that proudly. Because I was proud to be not only a member, but a youth minister for the Church of Christ. And, and, and I think sometimes we think, well, I'm going to church, you know, but I, I'm not very proud of it. I, I think we need to be, because where we go, what we participate in worship, what we're associated with is Jesus. And Jesus says, upon this rock, I Build my church. It's the church of Jesus Christ. He's the owner. He's the one we, we go to and worship. He paid for, for our salvation through his blood. This morning, as every Lord's Day, we have the opportunity for those who have not become Christians to become a Christian. And what an exciting day, what an exciting opportunity that is to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But when, and, you know, and it's interesting because I, I think that question is going to come to us, whether it's in this life or the next. What do you believe? And I don't want my answer to be that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I live my life for Him. And maybe that you become a Christian, you kind of wandered away, and you need to get back on the road. Pray for you, pray with you. Once you come, as we stand.
There's a stranger at the door. Let us all return for our next point in time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 